Welcome to the Supernatural Life Podcast with Chad Gonzalez, a podcast all about helping you connect with God so you can manifest God to the world. Now, here's your host, Chad Gonzalez. Hey friends, this is Chad Gonzalez. I want to welcome you to this episode of the Supernatural Life Podcast. It's our goal to help you connect with God so you can manifest God to your world. I'm so very excited about the month of September. We've got some great things in store for you, all of our partners and friends. We have a great meeting coming up in the end of this month at Big Bear Lake, California. That's right. We're going to be back in Big Bear Lake. We were there later in the latter part of the spring and very much looking forward to being back there again. We have such tremendous services there and always a lot of fun. Uh, We've got that coming up. And then we also have the advanced conference in Birmingham. You know, we have our annual advanced conference in Tampa. Uh, We call it the advanced, but uh, it's been on my heart for a while. And we're in the process of implementing this and taking the advanced conference to various cities around the U.S. and around the world. And so we've got the advanced Birmingham, and then we'll be looking to add one to two more dates in the U.S. in the spring. Then we'll have the advanced conference in Tampa again in June. And then uh, the plan is we'll be back and we'll do an advanced conference in London, uh, probably latter part of next summer or the fall. But anyway, so excited about what God is doing. We've got the advanced conferences that we're working on, got some new books and got some new uh, audio projects that we're working on. There's some great, great stuff. We're staying very, very busy but God is good. I want to make mention to you as well about the new CGM app that's for your phone. If you didn't know about it, you need to check it out. You can go download it for free in the Apple Store or Google Play and uh, get that for your phone. There's a lot of great features there that you won't be able to access anywhere else on social media or on our website. One of my favorite features is the chat feature in which you can talk and talk to others and Uh, I wanted this in there just for us to continue to build community. And even as the ministry continues to grow, I still want that community feature there uh, for us to to grow as a family and friends and and a community and and an army. So go check it out. Available for free. You can download it today. Uh, Just go and search Chad Gonzalez Ministries and it'll pop right up there for you. And you can download that for your phone for free. So praise the Lord. Hey, let us get into our message for today. You know, the last couple of days in my study time and just just going through life and the thoughts that continue to come back to me in regards to our dominion and our words, you know, oh, I'd say about three or four days ago, I decided just to pull my Bible out. I got a brand new Bible and decided to start going through the Gospels and just rereading them. You know, I always enjoy starting off with a new Bible. There's no marks, there's no highlights, no notes or anything like that on my own. And just starting fresh and reading with fresh eyes, so to speak. And as I began to read, there was something that I began to notice. And it was the fact of how many times Jesus was rebuking things. Now, we also, we know the times that we see the times that he rebuked the disciples and rebuked the Pharisees. But I'm talking about the things that stood out to me was the times that he rebuked things of the earth. Now, we did a message in the Supernatural Life podcast, and we also did a few messages in our weekly healing talks uh, sometime last year, and we were talking about dominion over the earth, subdue the earth. It was a powerful, powerful teachings that we looked at, and uh, we talked about some of those things in our book, Alternate Reality. But it's just an area that that I've been feeling pulled back to that there's some things in that arena. Certainly, we have not gone as far as God is wanting us to go in our dominion on the earth. We're certainly not seeing that. But the great thing is that Jesus gives us an example of what is possible. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 12, whoever believes in me will do the same works and even greater works because I'm going to my father. And so it's very, very important that we don't look at the, the words of Jesus and the works of Jesus and say, oh, well, the reason Jesus did that was because he was Jesus. Well, yes, he was Jesus. Yes, he was a son of God. But again, like we go over so many times, Jesus was doing life as a man anointed by God, filled with God, united with God. 
And Jesus goes on to say that you and I, we can do the very same works. Well, some of those works includes our dominion and our authority on this earth. And it all goes back to the original command of God. I kind of like to look at this as the original Great Commission, you know, and we find it in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. After verse 26, God has made man in his likeness and his image according to his likeness. In verse 28, God gives them a command. He said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And too many times, this passage of scripture, this verse, this command, has only been looked at from the standpoint of, hey, get married, go and have lots of kids. But you realize there's so much more to this life than just getting married and having children. No, you see, God tells man, tells Adam, tells Eve, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and do what? Subdue it. So it's much more than just having babies. You've, you've multiply, fill the earth, fill it with what? Not just more people. Good grief. Fill it with the presence of God. Fill it with heaven. Fill it with the things of heaven. We see that, that the Garden of Eden, it was, a, it was a representation of heaven on earth, but outside that garden, it didn't look like heaven. It was going to be Adam's responsibility to go outside that garden and make the rest of the world, make the rest of the earth look like the garden. It was his responsibility. Because notice, when he went outside that garden, it wasn't like the garden at all. The garden was, was a representation of heaven. And Adam was going to have to go out, outside of that garden, and make the rest of the earth look like it. How was he going to do that? He was going to do that with the dominion that he had over the earth. And he was going to do that by making the earth come under his dominion. He was going to subdue it. And he was going to fill it. He was going to fill it with the things of God and make it look like the way that it needed to, to make it look like heaven. And so it's very interesting. Again, you start talking about Jesus and his words, and people want to immediately go off on this tangent about, well, Jesus did that because he was God. Well, but what about all the people under the Old Testament and the Old Testament under the Old Covenant who subdued the earth? You know, we've looked at Moses and Exodus where they come up before the Red Sea and God tells Moses, take your rod and you divide it. You divide the sea. We see where Moses, he hits the rock and causes water to come out of it. We see the second time where God told Moses to speak to the rock. Of course, Moses didn't believe him. God was trying to elevate him and his faith and his dominion and showing him that there was power in his words, but Moses didn't believe him. And ultimately, that's what cost him his life and going into the promised land. But we see Moses doing these things. We see Elijah and Elisha using their dominion over there. They're, they went up to the Jordan River, both of them, and caused the waters to divide, and they walked across the dry land. We see where uh, Elijah multiplied food for 100 men. Like, we see dominion being taken place by man. And these guys, they weren't saved. They weren't born again. They weren't sons of God. They were slaves. They were servants of God. They, they had their righteousness on credit. They weren't in the position with God that we are. I mean, even Jesus said about John the Baptist that John the Baptist was the greatest, the greatest prophet to ever walk on, on the planet. But he also said, those of you that are least in the kingdom of God are greater than John. So you and I, as born-again, spirit-filled believers, we are in a far, far greater position in the kingdom of God than any of the people that we read about under the Old Covenant. So don't fall into the religious trap of saying, well, the reason Jesus did the things he did was because he was Jesus. Well, what about Moses? What about Joshua, who commanded the sun to stand still? What about Elijah? What about Elisha? What about David? What about Samson? What about all of these guys who did tremendous, tremendous things, saw tremendous miracles and, and used tremendous dominion and authority on the earth? What about those guys? See, we can't always fall back on the religious excuse as to why we don't need to, to go after the supernatural and the miraculous simply because we want to use the excuse that, well, Jesus was God. 
No, if you read what Jesus actually said, Jesus actually says in John 14, he says, I can do nothing of myself. He says it John 14, he says it John chapter 5. But John 14, Jesus says, the Father on the inside of me doing the works. We got to stick with the scripture and let, let the scripture speak and build our doctrine and realities on that, not on what our little peanut brain can come up with that makes sense for us. And we use, use that, that religious excuse that Jesus was God and use that to justify our lack of results or our, our lack of hunger or push to go after these things. No, that's why it's so important to go back and look at the people under the old covenant. Let them inspire you and show you what the floor looks like. Remember, these, these guys, they are in a far less position than you and I. And look at all the things that they did. So getting back to where we started with Jesus, you know, I told you I was going through the Gospels and just looking at the times Jesus rebuked things. What this comes down to is Jesus using his words, Jesus using his dominion and causing the earth to be in submission to him. So I want to give you a couple of these examples. And we're going to talk about it this month, and we're going to go into it in more detail next month. We're also going to be talking about it more in some of our healing talks. I've just really, really sensed that it's time to go back and start spending some more time looking at the power of our words and our dominion and go a lot deeper in it than what we have done over the last several decades. So if you have your Bible, look at Matthew chapter 8. And in verse 26, this is when... Jesus and the disciples, they are on the sea, and there is a great storm that comes about. In verse 26, it says, Jesus said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? And then Jesus arose, and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. He rebuked this, the winds and the sea. I mean, we're not talking about rebuking a cancer or rebuking a snotty nose or rebuking a tumor. We're talking about Jesus rebuked the winds and he rebuked the sea. We're talking about rebuking things of the earth. Now, this certainly applies in the area of sickness and disease, and we're going to see an example of it. But I want to elevate your faith. I want to expand your soul so we can expand our dominion. Look at this. Jesus rebuked the winds and sea. He spoke to it. I mean, I guess you could ask the question, can the wind hear? I mean, we can't even see the wind. But obviously, it heard because it obeyed. He rebuked the winds and the sea. Now, this is interesting. This word rebuke, this word rebuke in the Greek, it's the Greek word epitomeo. And I, I'm sure I just butchered it really bad, but you can spell it E P I T I M A O. Epitomeo or epitomeo, and it simply means this, to censure, to mete out due measure, to sternly tell or to warn to prevent something from going wrong. I like that. I like that right there. Comes, that's straight from Strong. So you can look that up, go online, go to Bible Gateway or um, Bible Study Tools, and look it up for yourself. But I pull this up out of a Greek lexicon. But I like this definition, to rebuke, to warn, to prevent something from going wrong. See, that's your and I responsibility. We are to destroy the works of the devil. When Satan begins to, to encroach upon an area in which he is not supposed to, to illegally trespass, that is where you and I, we have the responsibility to censure him. We have the responsibility to meet out due measure. We have the responsibility to warn, sternly tell, to push him back, tell him where to go to prevent something from going wrong. See, you and I, we are the what? We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Come on, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus who knew no sin became sin, so you and I would become the righteousness of God in Christ. We are right, and you and I are so right that we are in a position to right the wrongs. And not just right the wrongs, but stop any wrong from starting to happen. Remember, the definition of rebuke 
is warning to prevent something from going wrong. So we don't always have to be, be the one to step in after something has gone wrong. We can be one to step in and stop something from going wrong. And that what Jesus was doing right here? He was rebuking. He was stopping the winds and the sea from, from, from going to a really bad place where it would hurt anyone, hurt the disciples there. He arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. Jesus' words carried life. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 63, he said, my words are spirit and they are life. So our words are spiritual things. How did God create the world? How did he create the universe? How? By words. He created by words. And that's what he was doing with Moses. He was trying to help Moses understand, hey, there's not just power in your hands and power in that rod. There's also power in your words. And that's why he was trying to get him, telling him, to speak to the rock the second time. But what? Moses didn't believe him. So what did Moses do? He went back to what he had faith in, that rod, instead of having faith in his words. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. They are are spiritual things and they are carriers, carriers of life. And friend, you you and I, we, we must understand, we've got to spend more time meditating on this, meditating on the reality that you and I, we are not in the kingdom of darkness anymore. We have been translated, transferred, conveyed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of his dear son, and the kingdom of which we operate in has far greater, far greater authority in it than the kingdom that we, are, we were from. We have to remember where we're at, where we're living from, where we're operating from, and that we live and operate in a place of dominion that what we can see, hear, feel, taste, and touch with our five physical senses, that th- these things that come through our physical senses, those are things we have dominion over. Why? Because God's original command, is His original great commission, what? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Subdue it. How do we subdue it? Well, one of the ways is rebuking these things. Rebuking things warning these things, rebuking them to prevent something from going wrong. Isn't that an interesting take? That we're not having to step in with the supernatural after bad things happen. We can stop things in the midst of things happening to prevent things from going wrong. Hmm. So we see that Jesus doing that with the winds and doing that with the sea. We also see this In the area of of the demonic, we see Jesus several times rebuke demons. Uh, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 18, this is the the story about the father who brought his son to the disciples. And in verse 18, it says, Jesus, he rebuked the demon and the demon came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. We see this happen several times. And just for sake of time, I'll give you the references. It's Matthew chapter 17 and verse 18. So this is where he rebukes the demon out of the child that was having seizures. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 25, Jesus rebukes an unclean spirit out of a man that was in a synagogue in Capernaum. And then we also see in Mark chapter 9 and verse 25 that Jesus, he rebukes a deaf and a dumb spirit. So obviously, so many times we see demonic spirits being rebuked, being cast out, and it was done by words. And we're pretty okay with that. That's why I didn't go and look at those, uh, look at those in depth today. So we're we're pretty much okay with that. But what I'm wanting us to really see are these times when words were being used to subdue the earth. We're okay with Jesus doing it, and then as a whole, we're okay with it on the demonic side of dealing with demons. But look at what Jesus did with the wind and the waves. And then I want you to see this instance in regards to sickness and disease. If you look at Luke chapter 4, and this is a story of Jesus when he was brought to Peter's mother-in-law. Peter's mother-in-law was very sick. She had a really bad fever. And in Luke chapter 4 and verse 39, it says that Jesus, he went into Peter's house. He stood over his mother-in-law and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and she served them. So, I mean, you could ask the same question that we asked about the wind and the waves. Can a fever hear? 
Does a fever have ears? Well, I don't know if it has ears, but it obviously heard and it obeyed. But see, why would it obey? Because, friend, the reason we have an issue understanding that and comprehending that is because we're looking at it from natural eyes. We're looking at it from a natural mind. It's time we gotta we got to step things up. we got to start seeing things from heaven's realities. You know, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. We need to start seeing things from that realm. We need to start seeing things from the heavenly realm. Start seeing things from a heavenly perspective, a spiritual perspective. Friend, we should not be spiritually dumb. We should not be spiritually ignorant. People that operate in the occult and on the demonic side of things, they should not be uh, more spiritually wise. They should not have uh, wider uh, eyes. It should not have, I could say it like this, they should not be more keen spiritually than you and I as believers. That's probably the best way to put it. They shouldn't be more spiritually keen, and yet, sadly, in in most situations, they actually are. They actually are. And I'm not just saying that to say it. I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've experienced it firsthand. Many people that are operating in the cult are far more sensitive spiritually, far more keen spiritually than most Christians. Why? Because they're far more aware of the spirit realm than most Christians. Friends, you and I, We are spirit beings. We are born of a spiritual world. We are sent from a spiritual world into this world, and we are to operate from that spiritual world while while we are going through this physical existence. Why? Because we are not a body. We are a spirit being. We are a spirit being. And our words are spiritual things. Our words are carriers of spiritual things. They carry life. And one of the things that we see Jesus do time and time again is using his words to bring the earth under his dominion, bring the earth in submission to him. He rebukes the demons. We obviously see that and we're okay with that. But then he also goes and he rebukes the winds and the waves. He rebuked the weather. He controlled the weather, friend. Think about it. He controlled the weather. But don't sit there and go, oh, well, it was Jesus. And that's no, 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 no. Don't forget about Joshua. Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, and he was a sinner. He wasn't born again. He was in a far less position with God than you and I. And we also see again, we see in Luke chapter 4, verse 39, Jesus, he rebukes a fever. He rebuked this sickness, and it immediately left. And the woman, Peter's mother-in-law, she immediately arose, and she began to serve then. She began to, to live and work and do like normal. How did that happen? Because Jesus used his dominion through his words to bring things that were of the curse, things that were of this realm under his dominion. How does that work? Well, we're going to talk about that more in the next episode of the Supernatural Life podcast. So, hey, I trust that this stirred you up a little bit. We just gave you a little taster of some things we're going to get into next month but hey i just want to say thank you to all of our partners all of you that are partners with chad gonzalez ministries thank you so very much for all that you do your prayers encouragement and support if you'd like to become a partner with chad gonzalez ministries you can very simply go to the website chadgonzalez.com and you can do that Uh, we'd highly encourage you if you would please go to our youtube channel and make sure and subscribe we want to see fifty thousand subscribers there very very soon So make sure and do that. And also download the CGM app for your phone. And it'll be a great, great blessing to you. Well, friends, we love you. We appreciate you. We thank you for all that you do. And we just want to let you know that we are so thankful for you. And we pray for you daily. Remember in Christ, we always win. We'll talk to you next month for another episode of the Supernatural Life Podcast.